And just to very briefly introduce myself uh, a little bit more, I'm, in terms of how I came to the scholarship, I'm originally from New Mexico, from Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is a city much like uh, a lot of the communities in this area. It's agricultural, at least historically, has a university, and it's within 50 miles of the Mexican border. And my college uh, research, my dissertation research, was primarily on New Mexico and the Spanish colonial period there, which has received a lot of attention from scholars. Um, I'm not deeply versed in the colonial history of this area compared to New Mexico. And a lot of what I've looked at is, is really initially comparing this area to New Mexico during the 18th century and the colonial period. And, and that's really how I started to arrive at this research. Um, and basically during this time period, this region was part of a colonial region called Nuevo Santander, um, which was Tamaulipas in South Texas. And Afro-Mexicans, uh, people of partial African ancestry, were a fairly substantial portion of the population during this, this colonial period, um, which is something of a contrast with New Mexico. New Mexico did have some people of African origin, but the overwhelming dynamic there was between uh, the native Pueblo people and Spanish colonists and central Mexican settlers. Um, and so just doing a little bit of comparison there uh, started me um, into this topic. And this presentation is going to focus more specifically on the history of Star County and Zapata County. Um, and part of that is because a lot of the records that I've looked at are from uh, three towns, Mierd, Revilla, which is now Guerrero, and Camargo, which are across from Star County and Zapata County, and looking at Afro-Mexicans and their descendants uh, in this time period. Now, the history of uh, people of African origin in this larger region extends all the way back to 1528 when Estevanico arrived with Cabeza de Vaca, a well-known Spanish explorer of the area, um, and Cabeza de Vaca and Estevanico Estevanico, who was uh, North African more um, traversed through this general area um, during their journey through North America from 1528 to 1536. And also all of the Spanish colonization of North and South America was also very much an African settlement because the Spaniards uh, participated extensively in the slave trade Many slaves arrived wherever the Spanish colonized, but also there was a substantial number of free blacks as part of this colonization. So there were um, African descended people who were soldiers and free colonists along with slaves. This is a somewhat different dynamic from Anglo-American slavery, which uh, even though there were free blacks, you didn't necessarily have a large contingent of black soldiers in the English colonies like you did in the Spanish colonies. Um, also, uh, the entire borderlands area from California to Florida has many settlements that had at least some uh, African or Afro-Mexican presence. Um, and just to give one little example of this, Los Angeles, which obviously became a very important city, uh, was founded by about 44 original settlers or pobladores, and of the 22 adults, uh, two were recorded as Negros and eight as Mulatos back in 1781. So 10 of the 22 adults who founded Los Angeles were of African origin. Um, and that pattern is, is generally true in many of the, the northern frontier settlements that the Spanish established uh, f during the um, colonial period. Now, in looking at the records over in uh, the r records that come from Mier, Camargo, and Revilla, one of the things I noticed is that you do see occasional references to mulattoes, and sometimes those references spike, and other times are relatively low, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but the thing that really struck me, just going through these records, was that many of these people who were identified as mulattoes in that particular area were associated with one very specific site known as La Hacienda or El Rancho de Miguel Perez. Uh, 
And so there's a site that many of these Afro-Mexicans in this area seem to pass through at some point in, in their own history. Um, and this is just a close-up of what's known as a Porciones map from the Texas Land Office. Um, and so this shows the general vicinity. This is, uh, and you have to forgive me because since they're, uh, since they're long strips from north to south, the names are, are, are listed that way. This map should be in a different direction, so that's why the, the towns are listed uh, in that, that uh, order. But El Sals, which is north of Rio Grande City, not a very populated place, maybe 50 people, give or take 50. <laughs> Um, but not a very populated place, but very well known in the region, very historic site. Um, is very close to this Porcion, known as the Porcion of Miguel Perez. And on this map, it, it looks like a fairly ordinary Porcion. It's not one of the big uh, extensive uh, uh, land grants that you see elsewhere in South Texas. It's not, uh, for instance, an, further down in the Rio Grande Valley, you see some of the grants that went to the Bailly family, which take up a big part of Cameron County. This is a relatively small um, portion, but it really struck me that repeatedly when someone was listed as an Afro-Mexican or mulatto, they were often identified as being born uh, at that site, or if they were getting married, they were identified as being from the Hacienda or the Rancho de Miguel Perez. And so it's, it's still something of a mystery to me why that particular site was associated with so many of these people, whether they had a community of their own uh, in this area or whether Miguel Perez and, and his family were involved in employing uh, or, or bringing up uh, either free blacks or, or, or slaves during this period. And I'll also add that there were also some indigenous or native people that were identified as servants of Miguel Perez as well. Um, now, um, just a, a little bit about Miguel Perez. Miguel Perez was born in 1731 and he was among the first settlers of the town of Camargo which is immediately south of Rio Grande City. Um, he arrived uh, around the age of 19 in 1749, uh, 1749 during the initial uh, colonization of the area by Jose de Escandon and his, his, um, his lieutenants. And so he's one of the original founders of the area or uh, uh, settlers of the area. Um, these settlers, um, if they were free settlers, they were granted uh, land strips known as porciones or, or and other types of land grants and so he's part of that wave of settlement um, and in the 1750 census of Camargo for instance he's listed as the oldest son of Jose Perez and Ana Maria de la Garza uh, his wife was uh, later Bernarda Hinojosa and um, she also appeared in the census as the daughter of Juan Crisostomo Hinojosa and Margarita Gonzalez who were also settlers and they held Porcion 103, which is just up uh, from here. And then uh, between the two, there are other members of this extended family. Um, and, and these are very familiar surnames in, in this region, Joaquin de la Garza Falcón. That combination de la Garza Falcón is something that you see among a lot of the uh, prominent settlers of the Rio Grande City area and uh, there, there's a long history of that family there and Jose de Hinojosa. Oh, I'll just also add as uh, just a little side note, you know, in, in New Mexico there are certain surnames that are very common there like, um, like Vigil and Otero that are kind of very local to New Mexico. Here obviously there are surnames like these that are very common here and, and, and here Hinojosa is a very common name, right? And so you see that in these Porciones records. Um, now, even though he was initially, Miguel Perez was initially associated mostly with Camargo, um, later in life he appears more in the Mier records. Mier is established a little further up, uh, very close to what's now Roma um, in 1752. And his uh, extended family uh, lives in this area. Um, and 
furthermore, um, there's a number of Afro-Mexicans and other um, people who are working as servants uh, that are associated with this. I know this is very faint up here, but this is just an example of uh, the type of uh, birth record that you find. Um, and I don't know if we'll, we can make this out, but up here. Um, and a lot of these records are, are kept by the, uh, the Mormons. Uh, they have a very extensive website where you can ac actually access mu much of this. But in these Mierd parish records, you see a lot of people who are identified as being from the Rancho de Miguel Perez, and a lot of them are uh, listed as mulatos. And so one of the first records that you see in the Mierd archives is the birth of a girl, Maria Andrea Gonzalez, daughter of Diego de Santiago Gonzalez and Casilda de Torres, born in 1777. Um, she and her uh, godparents, Hippolito Javier and Maria Francisca Dorotea Ambrisa, were all identified as servants on the Rancho de Miguel Perez. And just to illustrate how these extended family networks formed, uh, a few months later, Gonzalez and, and Torres, her, her parents, were listed as the godparents of another child named Francisco Roman, who's identified in the records as Indio or Indian, the child of Vicente Domingo Montoya. Montoya, very common name in New Mexico, so I was kind of happy to see that here. And uh, Rosa Maria Garcia, common almost all over. Um, and they're also listed as servants of the Miguel Perez ranch. And so you have children born on this ranch their godparents are also generally from this ranch. And most of these uh, uh, people are listed as servants and as mulatos, people of mixed African origin, or as indios, the, the term for, for indigenous Americans. Um, and so you see that type of record in these parish records. Um, and it almost gets to the point that I see Hacienda de Miguel Perez or Miguel Perez is almost just uh, an identity stamp. It, it sort of indicates that these people are from that particular place. Um, in many cases, they're listed as servants. In most cases, they're listed as negro or, or um, excuse me, mulatto or indio. Um, and you see a kinship network suggested in those records. And even though Miguel Perez died in 1786, you still see that identification appear in these records. And really late in the colonial period, uh, in, on June 4th, 1814, there was a, a, a child named Jose Hippolito, Hippolito Tanguma, who was listed as a casta or mixed race person. By this point, that's the co more common label, uh, but also listed as being from the Hacienda de Miguel Perez. Um, now, by that year, there were 127 baptisms in Mier in 1814. And out of those, 21 were listed as castas with no further racial description. Um, there's a general breakdown of these caste labels toward the very end of the Spanish colonial period. Um, now, the next um, set of records is from a 1788 census of Nuevo Santander, which is essentially what's now Tamaulipas and Texas south of the Nueces River, all the way up to around Corpus Christi, though most of the towns are right along the lower Rio Grande in, in South Texas. Um, there were 23,514 total Spanish subjects in that census. That number amazed me because in New Mexico, there was roughly the same population at that time, about 20 to 25,000 people. But the Spanish colonization of that area began in 1598, uh, whereas this colonization began in 1749. So this area grew much more rapidly uh, than New Mexico, um, which is the other sort of comparable, comparably sized northern frontier province. Texas had about 3,000 Spanish subjects at that time. Uh, Alta and Baja California combined maybe 3,000. So. Nuevo Santander and New Mexico are really the most populous of, of these frontier provinces during that time period. Um, I always take these labels, as, as I do any uh, sort of census type ethnic labels, even in, in the modern US census, with a, a great degree of caution, because they reflect uh, 
uh, oftentimes just the judgment of officials and not necessarily how people perceive themselves. And they don't necessarily reflect the actual genealogies of all the people living in the colony. But they do provide an indication of how the people of this region are being perceived. Um, and so about 22% of the population in that census is listed as Espanol. That portion is going to be higher in the Rio Grande uh, area. You have to keep in mind, uh, Tamaulipas goes pretty deep into northern Mexico. And so uh, the Espanol population or the Spanish uh, population is about a little under a quarter. But late in the colonial period, you see those numbers go up dramatically as more people assume that identity. Indians, including those in Christian settlements, this isn't necessarily including the people that are outside of Spanish settlements, um, such as Apache, Lipan Apache, Comanche, and other groups, are 20% in that census, which has actually shocked me for being that high, because usually in these northern frontier communities, uh, relatively few people are being claimed as indigenous within the Spanish settlements. Um, Lobos, or people of mixed Indian and African ancestry, were about 15%. Mestizos, I, I would figure this would be the biggest category or one of the larger categories, but strictly speaking, people of Indian and European ancestry are being listed as 13%. Mulatos, 12.5%. Uh, castas, which is basically every other uh, mixed group that the Spanish identify, about 12% and Negros, more or less unmixed Africans, 5.8%. And that number is higher as you go further down the Gulf Coast. Now, these numbers in and of themselves, I'm, I'm not going to you know, say that these are extremely accurate numbers. And a lot of times you see from one census to another, these figures do swing. And specific categories are sometimes redefined from one census to the other. But the lesson I get from this and from looking at the, the parish records is that Afro-Mexicans are certainly a presence in the region. Uh, the, the specific number is, is perhaps hard to, to ascertain. But if you add up the three groups that have some African ancestry, you have a pretty substantial uh, percentage, about 32 um, about, um, or 33 percent, about a third are being identified as having some documented African ancestry in that census. Now, in other censuses, those numbers are not quite like that. Um, and, and, and so I don't want to fixate too much on these numbers uh, specifically, but they do indicate that there is a, a, a noticeable presence of people of African ancestry. Um, now, one of the caveats that I, I place on um, categorizing uh, how we categorize people at this time is that a lot of times the categorization fell largely on how a, a single official or a priest would, would judge someone else. And so for instance, in looking at the, the Mier parish records, you have different priests. Uh, there are actually Franciscans who are serving as, as, as priests within the Mier parish. And you see that each priest has a very different uh, uh, percentage um, of, of mulattoes and other groups. And so, for instance, um, there are some priests that, that categorize people very broadly as mulatto, and then others who almost never use the label, and they only say like casta or mixed race. And so you can see that these priests sometimes have very different judgments as to who is who. Um, and so that's one of the things that limits the use of that is a lot of this is in the eye of the beholder. Um, another example of an observation on caste and race in this region from this time period comes from a man named Pedro O'Crowley. And, and that surname indicates uh, that there's another uh, dimension of this diversity. He's actually of Irish origin. Um, and he's, uh, but he identifies as a Spaniard. He's, he's from Spain. He's born in Spain, but his ancestry was Irish. Um, and that was because you had quite a few Irish Catholics leave Ireland and go to places like France and Spain uh, during the frequent wars with the British crown. Um, so O'Crowley traveled through the region uh, around 1763. And he uh, drew some what were known as cast drawings. These are kind of a cruder version of the cast paintings that were produced uh, 
in places like Mexico City. Uh, and he depicts with some frequency people of African origin. But he also kind of indicates that the caste system in the border area is a little more relaxed than it is in, say, Mexico City. And so, for instance, in this particular drawing, he depicts Espanol and uh, Castiza, uh, someone of maybe a, about a fourth native ancestry, as having a child that's identified as Spanish or Espanol. Um, and then at, at the bottom, Espanol y Negro, um, and he doesn't get the gender right, I guess, but Espanol y Negro, mulatto. Um, and so he's describing uh, caste in these, these pictures. He makes a, a comment that, quote, many pass as Spaniards who in their hearts know that they are mulattoes. And so he insinuates that many of the people in the region that identify as Spaniards are actually people of some African origin. Now keep in mind he's from Europe and so um, a lot of times people in Spain and in Europe had a somewhat negative attitude towards the Creoles of the Americas and they saw them as somewhat questionable in terms of their status as, as equals in the colonial system. Um, I'll also add that he observed that, you know, in Mexico City at that time, uh, someone of partial African ancestry might be identified as, for instance, a morisco, a torna atras, a tente en el aire, a lobo, a chino, or an albarazado. There were many very specific caste labels for specific fractions of ancestry. But he states that in the border area, in, in the sort of Texas, Tamaulipas, New Mexico area, people almost always just say mulatto instead of all those different caste identities. So there's a simplification of caste in the frontier. And there's also a climate where people do pass. Uh, they go from central Mexico to this area, and if they're light-skinned, they might say they're Spaniard. Uh, if they're mulatto in, or, or of African origin in central Mexico, they move up uh, to th this area and say they're mestizo. And so he notes that th there's, it's very common for people to pass um, from one caste category to another as they move north. Um, now another, um, I think perhaps the fundamentally a very important label that you also see in these records, and you see people identified with this label regardless of their ancestry, is vecino, which literally means neighbor, but in the context of the colonial, uh, of the colonial period, it, it means someone who's a fully vested member of that community. So a vecino is someone who lives in a community, generally owns some property, uh, and they have full, if they're, if they're male, they have full political rights, and if they're female, they also have property rights, and women in this area had property rights that Anglo-American women uh, during the colonial period didn't have. And so, um, vecino basically means you're a fully vested member of the community. And vecino status could arrive even if you weren't necessarily of unmixed Spanish ancestry. And so being a vecino was very significant to many of the people in this area. Um, and many uh, of, of the people of mixed origin for, for, or maybe even indigenous or African origin from central Mexico, when they moved into this area, they were able to acquire some property and with that property become a vecino and become a more fully vested member of that community. Um, and one good example of this is uh, the Benavides family, or at least one of the Benavides families of the region. Um, there, um, there was a, a, a land grant held by Isidro Benavides. This is in Zapata County, and much of this is actually underwater now because of Falcon, Falcon Reservoir. Um, but um, Isidro Benavides was listed as a mulatto. He acquired this land grant during the colonial period. Um, in 1768, there's a birth record for his son, Jose Ponciano Benavides, uh, son of Isidro Benavides, that landholder, in, and uh, Maria Olaya Rubio. And they're listed as mulatos in the, in the record. But one of the things that's remarkable about th that record, and it really stood out to me, is there's more detail in this record than the typical record. Um, for instance, 
Um, his godparents are listed, his two godparents are listed, which is standard. But then those godparents' parents are listed, which is very rare. And it's almost a way of vouching for the identity of these godparents. And having, you know, I hate to put it this way, but having good, solid godparents was one of the ways that, that a family could sort of rise up the social hierarchy by basically stating that even if they don't have the highest caste status, very well-respected members of the community are basically fictive kin or they're embedded within their family. And so Benavides' record is very remarkable for that reason. Um, he's, he's also, in, in some respects, um, climbing up the, the caste ladder and the social hierarchy. Um, a little bit later in life, in 1792, Jose uh, Benavides marries to Maria Antonia Molina in Revilla, which is now called Guerrero. And in that record, he appears as a mestizo. So he was born uh, with the record mulatto. When he gets married in 1792, he's listed as mestizo. Now, some of that's just the general breakdown of the caste system in the end of the colonial period, that, that people get more casual about these labels. Uh, some of it might also be the judgment of the particular priest involved. But there's also a, just a, a very gradual shift upward in the social hierarchy and the social ladder uh, for that particular family um, as, as landholders, as vecinos, and as uh, starting out as mulatos and then becoming mestizos in some of these records. Um, now, you know, toward the end of the, the, the colonial period, um, you know, these caste labels largely go away. Um, the last people that you see identified as by caste are around 1822 when word of Mexican independence starts to, to reach the region. And when Mexico became independent, it formally abolished these caste categories. But you still see other uh, distinctions like vecino continues to be an important distinction. But also, you start to see terms like don and doña, you know, basically sir or, or ma'am uh, uh, or, or, or sir and lady um, become important little distinctions. And another little distinction that I see in some of these records is because many people do identify as Espanol or Spaniard. You see some people identifying as todos españoles, uh, that all of their ancestors are Spanish or that they're kind of, they're kind of one-upping uh, the, the larger population that identifies as Spanish by being more specific and maybe asserting an even higher status. And so you see th this jockeying for status within uh, these records. Um, now, one thing that um, I'll, I'll also add is that with independence in 1821, because caste records go away and you don't see people explicitly identified as caste, it's harder and harder to examine an Afro-Mexican presence after that point. And so people that are the descendants of these Afro-Mexicans are no long, longer being identified um, as distinct, distinct from the larger population. And you see sort of a, a, a blending of the population. Um, and, and, you know, one example of this is um, in eight, 1829, uh, Vicente Guerrero, who was the president of Mexico, himself of partial African ancestry, abolished slavery in Mexico. And after that point, you also no longer see people listed as slaves. Um, Texas, there's a bit of an exception, uh, because in Texas, there's actually the maintenance of slavery under other names. But you see a decline in people being listed as African. Um, or mulatto. But because you still have the colonial era records, you can still trace some family lineages. And there are some very prominent people um, in the early 19th century borderlands who do have African ancestry or were listed as mulatto at the time of their birth. And then after Mexican independence, they remain in the region and they become fairly prominent in some cases. And I think this also illustrates the fact that people 
of African origin could climb up the social ladder in ways that would be unusual in, in say, the American South during that time period. And so two well-known examples of this more broadly uh, are Pio Pico and his brother Andres. Pio Pico was actually uh, from Los Angeles and he was the last Mexican era governor of Alta California, what's now the state of California. And he was of partial African ancestry. His ancestors were some of the mulattoes that settled Los Angeles in the colonial period. Um, closer to this part of the world, um, one of the more significant Tejano leaders during the era of Texas independence and the period afterward was a man named Antonio Menchaca from San Antonio who was listed as, uh, by birth as a mulatto. He was the son of soldiers at the Presidio uh, at, at Bejar, uh, or in, in San Antonio. And he was a prominent soldier during the Texas Revolution on the Texas side. And like many Tejanos, after Texas independence, he struggled to maintain these political rights. And part of, uh, I think, part of the story uh, with that is the fact that you do have some Tejanos that have documented African ancestry or look like they're part African and that creates a very difficult uh, to say the least position for them because Texas once it becomes a republic uh, effectively denies citizenship for African Americans um, denies even the uh, settlement of free blacks during the republic period and of course, until Reconstruction in 1868, um, formally denies citizenship and voting rights. And of course, after that, that's, that's uh, voting rights in particular still contested through the 20th century. Um, so people like Menchaca, um, like many Tejanos, are struggling for recognition in the Republic of Texas, um, recognition as veterans of, of the Texas War of Independence. Uh, struggling to hold on to their political influence within San Antonio. Uh, but they sometimes they have the double um, struggle as people that are at least somewhat of African ancestry uh, in a place that formally denies African Americans uh, basic civil rights. And so this is part of what's going on in the Mexican borderlands. You do have prominent people with some African ancestry who have some political status at least during the Mexican period. After U.S. annexation, a lot of these people do lose their political influence alongside the larger uh, Mexican-American community, um, especially in California and Texas. New Mexico is something of an exception to that, but New Mexico also remains a territory uh, until 1912. Um, now closer to, very close to this part of the world, there, I don't have a photograph of him because he uh, died in 1840. But there was a, another very prominent person born as a mulatto during the late colonial period named Antonio Jose Zapata. And Zapata was uh, baptized in 1797 in Revilla as a mulatto, the son of Ignacio Zapata and Maria Antonia Rocha. Um, in 1821, right as Mexico is becoming independent, he marries um, in, in the same parish and he's listed as a casta. So he's, he's listed as someone of mixed origin in 1821. But when Mexico became independent, a lot of the barriers, at least for, for these castas, are removed from holding political office and uh, from participating in, in, in political life. And so he became a judge or a juez. Um, he became um, a military officer, a militiaman. Uh, he engaged in campaigns between Mexican soldiers and the Comanche and Lipan Apache. So you also have the uh, Afro-Mexicans participating in wars with native people, which is another uh, dimension to this. And by the 1830s, alongside other political leaders from this area, he becomes d disillusioned with the centralist policies of Santa Ana and other Mexican leaders. And he was one of the key participants with Antonio Canales in what was known as the Republic of the Rio Grande. Um, in 1840, in which uh, people in this region, uh, many of the people in this region and armed militias rose up and declared their independence from Mexico and, and attempted to form a republic in what's now Tamaulipas, Coahuila, and Nuevo León. And he was a, a key figure in that. 
but in 1840 he was arrested for treason by Mexican federal forces and, and beheaded um, in Guerrero. Um, and I'll just add that Antonio Zapata is the only, um, he's the namesake or the, the, he, he, uh, of Zapata County. Um, and so this is probably the only county in Texas that's named after someone of African origin. Um, and this is just one example of several prominent people of African birth, or, or I mean I should say African ancestry, um, often listed as mulattoes who became prominent in the region during this time period. Um, Quintar Taylor, who's a well-known historian of African Americans in the West, Western U.S., uh, has a book called In Search of the Racial Frontier. And he reminds us in this book that for three centuries, persons of African ancestry moved north from Mexico rather than west from the Atlantic to reach the Western frontier. And so from 1528 until the 1820s, people of African origin that enter areas like Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California are moving up from Mexico, not from the, the east coast of the United States. Um, and in both of the, these movements to the north and from the east coast to the west, people of African origin sought opportunities for land ownership, uh, the rights of citizenship, and just as Afro-Mexicans arrived at the colonial frontier to seek these land grants and uh, to seek uh, status perhaps as soldiers um, and to secure economic self-determination, after the arrival of the United States and the annexation of 1848, and especially after the Civil War, African Americans arrive in the region for very similar motives, to acquire land after the end of slavery and also in military service. But that pattern al already existed with some of these Afro-Mexicans before 1848. Um, there are some historians, um, very able historians, who've looked at the later period after 1848, which I'm not covering so much, such as Alberto Rodriguez and Omar Valerio Jimenez, who've examined how African Americans and others from the American South interacted with Mexican and Mexican-American people in the lower Rio Grande where there were um, uh, fairly uh, significant instances of intermarriage <coughs> between African-Americans and Mexican-Americans um, and there was some uh, uh, acculturation. Uh, one of the things that Alberto Rodriguez points out is that in 1900 Hidalgo County uh, was the county in the United States with the highest percentage of black-white marriages. Now one caveat to that is that in 1900 the census generally categorized Mexicans and Mexican-Americans as whites and so many of those marriages were actually between African-Americans and Mexicans or Mexican-Americans. Now that did violate the laws of Texas at that time but you did have this intermarriage and in looking at some of the census records from 1850, 1860, I do see people listed as, as African American, as, as colored, uh, free people of color, living in households with Spanish surnamed people. So you do see that acculturation and that mestizaje continue after 1848. Um, one of the complexities, especially of this region, but it's true across the borderlands, is even when there are some very intense and ugly conflicts between Anglo-Americans and Mexican-Americans, between African-Americans and sometimes people from both communities, such as at Brownsville in 1906, even, the, even in the periods of very intense violence, you also have intermarriage and you have acculturation. And so this area witnesses intermarriage between African-Americans and Mexican-Americans, and sometimes with Anglo-Americans as well. But in the midst of that, you still have some very serious racial conflict. For instance, in 1899, there was an incident called the Rio Grande City Riot, in which um, residents of Rio Grande City, both Mexican and Anglo-American, uh, objected to the stationing of African-American soldiers at Ringgold Barracks, and those tensions 
resulted in a white officer at Ringgold Barracks firing a gun, uh, firing a, a Gatling gun or a machine gun into Rio Grande City. And while it didn't kill anyone, it, it was a very violent act. Most of, many of the houses of Rio Grande City were shot up in that particular um, incident. And that event illustrates the very significant tensions that could take place in this area. Um, perhaps better known is what's known as the Brownsville Affair um, in 1906 when um, a couple of uh, people in Brownsville, a bartender named Frank Natus and a police officer listed as uh, Officer Dominguez, no first name given in the records of that time, were, were killed by um, African Americans, or allegedly killed by African Americans stationed at Brownsville. There was never any solid evidence that they killed those two people, but all of the black soldiers at Fort Brown were dismissed uh, from, with dishonorable discharges in 1906. So these very ugly racial incidents did take place in this area, but at the same time, you have a fairly high percentage of intermarriage compared to the rest of the United States. Um, so the deep historical connections that bind African American and Mexican American communities in South Texas deserve wider attention. A greater public awareness of this Afro-Mexican past illustrates these communities' shared history with slavery and servitude. And, and one of the lessons from this that I'll, I always uh, share with, with students is that a lot of times we think of uh, slavery as a history that mainly took place in the old American South, east of here. But there was the enslavement of Native people and Africans in this uh, region as well. Um, you also have um, very similar struggles to acquire land, to acquire citizenship between all of these communities. And this Afro-Mexican story sort of unites these two histories of, of civil rights. Um, the Afro-Mexican legacy, I think, really complicates how we understand both American history and the history of this area. Even today, um, if you look at a lot of US history survey texts, or approaches to teaching US history, there's a very strong tendency to cast America's history in a black and white racial paradigm. Civil rights are a black-white issue. Uh, colonization in the 13 colonies involved white and black colonists. And, and other groups, including Mexican Americans, are sometimes hard to place within that paradigm. If you look at this Afro-Mexican history, you can kind of appreciate how Mexican-American history also fits in with that paradigm and should also be included even when you discuss these types of relationships such as slavery um, um, and, and emancipation and resistance to slavery. Also in the borderlands it's very common to use another binary or two-part relationship that of Anglo and Hispanic and, and a lot of times you see in uh, borderlands history books or Texas history books the use of Anglo and Hispanic as encompassing all of these local dynamics. But if you look at this Afro-Mexican population and the later African-American population in the area, you see that that dynamic is actually very complex. It includes people like Pio Pico and Antonio Menchaca, who were Hispanic, who were Tejano and Californio, but also were of African origin and were seen as such and identified as such on some level. And that adds some complexity to that, dyna that dynamic. And so I think examining this historical framework is very critical to understanding the history of this country and this community. So I'll pretty much conclude with that, but I'll certainly stick around for any questions or comments or critiques. Thank you.